let's all stand for worship. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet, praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing, praise him with the string instruments and horn. Praise him with the clash of cymbals, praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath 
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all your uh, so many blessings. Uh, thank you for giving us a new day. 
Um, you just uh, you bless us with uh, so many different things, Lord, and we so often uh, take that for granted. I pray that you would just give us spiritual eyes to see all that uh, you have blessed us with, and we would um, just continue to um, walk in just that appreciation for you. Um, Lord, as we uh, dive into your word this morning, I pray that uh, you would use the words of the speaker just to really impact us and that um, uh, we would just uh, hear and learn something new about you um, and that uh, it would be something that we will uh, be able to guard in our hearts and uh, apply in our lives. I would just pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, today, our uh, speaker is uh, Pastor Thad Birdmeyer. Uh, he actually goes to our church, so uh, thank you so much for speaking here. Um, he is involved with a uh, missions organization called ABWE, um, and that's a missions, uh, a church planting uh, mission. Uh, so thank you so much for your involvement in that. Uh, please give Mr. Birdmeyer a warm uh, welcome. All right, thanks, Toma. We good? Hey, good to be here, guys. Good to see you. And uh, a lot of you that I already know and have met before, it's a pleasure. <clears throat> and it's an honor to be able to come hang out with you guys in chapel, man. Music was good. You guys are good. Like, that's awesome. Like, you should do more than two songs. Right? No? Awesome. Well, uh, Toma said, my name is Thad, and uh, about a year ago, after about 18 years in pastoral ministry, we kind of transitioned out of the church to work with a missions organization called ABWE. We are on mission with the church to reach um, every ethne. It's the Greek term for nations, so go make disciples of all nations. And so we want to work with churches in North America to help them plant churches to reach even ethnic groups in North America. You probably are unaware of this, but the church in our country is struggling. Um, it's estimated about f between 3,500 and 4,000 churches close their doors every year. About 1.2 million people will leave the church this year and never return. And just think about that. 1.2 million people will walk out of the church at some point this year and never return to, to, uh, uh, to even go to church. Why is this? I get asked that question a lot, and I get asked that question like, why do you think the church is in decline in North America? Why do you think this sort of stuff happens? I'm sure there's many reasons for it, but uh, I think one of them is this, is that people, even young people like you, have either lost or never really understood the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's something that you have been inoculated with. It's something that you have heard a lot about, but it's never really, you've really grasped or understood the grace that he offers. So uh, let me illustrate it for you in uh, one way in which maybe this failure to understand the gospel kind of comes out in our lives. So, so every person that I know, especially every young person I know, carries around with them this fear in relationships, so maybe you've experienced this before in your life. We have this fear that if people really know what's really, really who I am, I, I doubt that they'll really love me. And so we, because of this fear, what we end up doing is we end up putting on masks and we end up kind of uh, uh, pretending to be someone who we really aren't because we want their love, because we want their hopes. It's generally true of all pe people. I think it's really true of young people. That is, um, once they realize that other people have a perception of them. But before that, when kids are really, really young, uh, they don't yet understand that the actions and the things that they do have an impact on how people view them. So, for example, my oldest son, who's now a senior, a lot of you guys might know him. He's a cool dude. And, uh, Man, and uh, I remember when he was in first grade, he came home from school one day, and as we normally do, we went through all of his papers and kind of did the parent thing and, and pulled out this one paper and realized he got 100% on this quiz or this test on coins and money. Now, as parents, we knew that he knew nothing about the value of a quarter. We still kind of question that a little bit, even now as a senior. 
We knew that he didn't really like, understand like, how much a dime was worth. And so we asked him, and I was just shocked and surprised. I'm like, hey, Carson, bud, man, that's awesome. I am so glad and so proud of you that you, that you know your coins and you know your currency like that. And, and he looks at me, just straight face, as, a, as any first grader could do. And he's like, oh, I don't know him at all. I just looked on Tatum's paper. <laughs> no filter, no fear, no, uh, no shame, no sorrow that of using someone else's paper to do his work, no fear of not being loved, no fear of, hey, hey, I might get in trouble for this. Now, you fast forward now, and I would really hope that my son knows he's going to be unconditionally loved by us, um, even if he struggles and fails, but there's probably a little bit more of a struggle on that filter now than he was when he was seven years old. Why is that? Because our culture, and unfortunately maybe even the church, has so ingrained in him and in us that if someone really knows what's really going on deep inside your heart, they probably will not like you, let alone love you. But friends, this is where the gospel of Jesus Christ kind of penetrates and confronts our false thinking. See, the gospel exposes our life. The gospel, if we truly understand it, it it shines light into all the dark corners of our soul that we so often try and hide. And in moments of utter shame and sorrow and fear that nobody could ever love me, God moves. He extends himself and he declares himself and he declares his love in ways that were really that are unimaginable for us. This is the gospel that you so often hear about and talk about. This is what we know about God, that he fully knows everything about us, He knows us in deeper and more intimate ways than we even know ourselves. And with this intimate knowledge of all of our junk, he loves us more than we can imagine. Or we could say it like this. He fully knows us and he fully loves us. And this is what I want to investigate with you this morning. Just really briefly, I want to talk about God's grace in this. God's grace, his mercy, and maybe even find out some ways that we might tend to misunderstand it. I'm going to read a little bit from 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. It says this, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. It says, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, verse 8 says. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while... Here it is, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will establish, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 10 there, he, Peter makes mention, he says, that after a little suffering, after a little while, the God of all grace... Now, what you got to understand is that Peter is writing this letter to a group of people who have trusted Jesus, and because of their trust in Jesus, their lives have been, like, scattered. They've been, it's been chaos. They have been um, uh, forced to leave their homes. They've been persecuted. They're suffering, all sorts of things. And so Peter writes to them and says, listen, I know that you're suffering. I know that things are bad, and I know that things are hard, and I know that... um, that your life has not turned out the way that you thought it was going to, but let me give you some hope and encourage you to be faithful. The heartbeat of what he wants to tell them, to remind them, is that God is a God of grace, all grace, not just some grace, not just partial grace, but he is all grace. Grace is something that Peter talks a lot about a lot in this book of 1 Peter, and maybe it's something because he felt so, so fresh in his life. Here he means that God is the possessor and the giver of all grace. There's no grace that ever happens that doesn't begin with and start with him. I know this is a term that you probably hear a lot about, but what is it? What does grace really mean? 
Well, let me give you a short definition, okay? Simply means this, undeserved favor, okay? Undeserved favor. It is this, God giving you what you do not deserve. Now, God's grace is often paired with its wonderful cousin, mercy, right? And in mercy, we see is God, um, mercy is not getting what we deserve. So grace is getting what we don't deserve, Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And they kind of work interchangeably in the scriptures. So maybe this illustration will help. When our kids were younger, we had a uh, thing that we used to do called not spare the rod. Maybe you guys have been through this before in your family, but um, when they would do stuff, we would take them into the bathroom. That was our place of not sparing the rod. (laughs) And uh, we talked to them about their disobedience, and we talked to them about their sin, and we talked to them about what they, they did, and, and uh, we would, <clears throat> we never punished them without them understanding how their actions were dishonoring to the Lord. And so what we would do is we'd go through this little um, conversation. We'd say, what have you done? And they would say, you know, I hit my brother with the toy truck or something, right? Because I was angry with him. Okay, and then we would ask him, well, what do you deserve? And because it would take some time to get that out of them, eventually they'd say, well, I deserve to be punished, and then we would punish them. Now, funny thing here is one day we're kind of going through this process, and what did you do? And I hit my brother, and, and uh, uh, <laughs> what do you deserve? And well, you deserve to be punished. And I said, you know what, bud, today, dad's going to have mercy on you. And he looks at me, and he's like, what does that mean? I said, well, you're not going to get what you deserve. That's mercy. Grace would be, and now we're going to Dairy Queen to get an ice cream cone. You don't deserve it, but we're going to give it to you. You see how mercy and grace kind of work hand in hand with each other? God's mercy is not giving us what we deserve. His grace is giving us what we don't deserve. And it is the presence of his giving something to us. It's unexpected. It's full. It's free. It's undeserved. It is not. Students, listen to me. Grace is never based on what we do, but it's always based on his will. Always. So when we read the Bible, grace is never witnessed as some sort of counterbalance to our merit. It's the opposite of merit. It's never given for how good we are. It's just the opposite. It's given based, uh, if it would be given on how good we are, it would no longer be grace. You get that? Now, as I've already said, God is the God of all grace. It's seen all throughout the Bible, even Though most people think it's only in the New Testament, what we find is that we can go all the way back to the very beginning, and there's pictures of God's grace from the very beginning. We're at a Christian school, right? So I can ask you some Bible questions? Okay. Who did God create first? I'm just kidding. When God created Adam and Eve, okay, and he placed Adam in the garden, do you remember what God told him not to do? Yeah, what's over here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, not to eat the fruit, right? In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat, you eat of it, you will surely what? Die, right? So he's, so he's like, Adam, don't eat of this one tree. Eat of any other tree, but don't eat of this one tree. For the day that you eat of it, you will die. What happens one chapter later? We find that the serpent comes, tempts Eve, convinces her to eat of the fruit from this one tree. She gives it to her husband, which the text says is with her by her side this whole time. She gives it to her husband. He eats it. And what happens? As soon as they take a bite of that fruit, does fire come up from the ground and consume them? Right? Does the tree all of a sudden like fall over, like smack them, just collapse them, right? No. Now, we often try and soften this in the church sometimes by saying, well, what God really meant here was that the death process would begin. And we'd say that what God meant is that they'll die spiritually. They'll become separated from him. And that's true. And that does happen. But if you had nothing else 
besides Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3, and you had nothing else, the rest of the scripture, and you were reading that text, and you read it, you would think that God meant you're going to die. And this is what I'm trying to say. When they eat of the fruit and do not die, the God of all grace is on, friends, full display. This is the first evidence of giving someone something they don't deserve. Time, physical life, redemption. And don't forget what God does right after that, right? What does God do after he tells them, here's the punishment of what's going to happen. Now he clothes them in their nakedness. I suppose some people we could speculate, well, maybe what God did is he just made this uh, skin appear. But I don't think so. I think what happens is God takes an animal and kills it in front of them to show them, hey, listen, death is going to happen but there is someone or there's something that can die in your place. The God of all grace is on full display. And this goes on and on and on throughout the Old Testament. In fact, the entire Old Testament record is chiefly a record of the grace of God. Some people think, well, I thought the New Testament was grace and the Old Testament was wrath. No. Ezekiel 18.4 says, the soul who sins is the one who will die. What happens throughout the, the entire Old Te Testament? People sin. Some are killed, absolutely, and some most don't. In God's mercy and his grace, they do not get what they deserve. And in his grace, they're given revelation and time to make things right. And what we see is that the full force of his wrath is delayed. His patience is seen so that grace would have time to work. And the grace of God does work. But how does the grace of God work? Why does the grace of God work? Because of one thing. And here's where we get to this central issue. Students, listen to me. Grace only works because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Only. See, here's the reason why the most endangered species on the planet is people like you who grow up in maybe Christian homes and go to Christian schools and you hear about the cross and you hear about Jesus and you hear about the gospel over and over and over and over and over again and you get to... man. You leave. Kids that grow up in the church, they leave the church so fast because, because they've never understood grace because to them it has become something about what they do. I'm not going to watch this movie and I'm going to dress this way and I'm going to um, obey these rules and I'm going to do this. And then I get out and I don't get into the school I want to. And I, um, the boy or the girl that I really like doesn't like me. And all of a sudden I'm like, fine, God, I did all these things for you and this is what I get. Because you've never understood grace. See, you've been told this so often that it's probably lost its meaning on you, but the greatest act of grace, in fact, all acts of grace find their ultimate center in the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's at the cross where God's perfect holiness is defended. It's at the cross of Jesus that the God of all grace is on full display. It's at the cross when Jesus dies in the place of sinners that we're invited in to be in this full presence of God and all of his holiness without shame. It's at the cross that God's wrath and his grace collide perfectly. See, God's grace, students, let me just emphasize this over and over and over again. God's grace runs deeper than you can imagine. It's astonishing to fathom however deep you may fall into sin. God's grace is always deeper still. Always. It goes further it goes farther than any sin we could ever commit. My son, who's, uh, I'll talk about him a lot, he has, uh, because I, I used to preach and pastor, you know, so he has this little uh, card that he wrote a quote from me. He has one quote from me in his room. So I'm always kind of curious to see what it is. And he puts it up there, it's right by his bed. And it says, no matter how many stupid things you do in your life, you're never outside the reach of God's grace. And I'm like, what stupid things have you done? Right? See, there's no limit to his grace. It goes deeper than we can comprehend. I mean, students, have you ever thought that you have done something so dumb and so stupid and so, like, no one could ever forgive me? Well, listen, God's grace goes further than that. 
You think you've done something that's so unforgivable. You have no idea about the super increasing grace of God, that his grace truly is amazing. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter if you're the best student. Like you could be here and you could be singing on the worship team and everything could be polished perfectly and you could be like the best student here and you're the kindest student at Cornerstone Christian Academy. Or if you're the vilest of students here, you're in desperate need of the grace of God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you think you've done nothing wrong or if you're in deep trouble, you need the grace of God. It doesn't matter if you sin a little or if you sin by the truckload, you need the grace of God. And it's deep enough to cover. His grace is truly amazing. And at the cross of Jesus, he destroyed all that sin is and all that sin can do. So how do we respond? What do we do? Like, what, how do we take from that? Students, you hear about this all the time. What do you do? Some people say that talking about grace in this way cheapens it by making it easy. I don't think so. Because what many fail to realize and what I think young people fail to realize is the costliness, the expensiveness of grace. It's never cheap. Why? Here's why. It is so costly. It just doesn't cost you. It costs Jesus his life. The only person to ever live this world and never do anything wrong it cost him his death. Grace is not cheap because it costs the life of the eternal son of God. It's only cheap when we don't understand this. It's only cheap when we take advantage of it. What do I mean by that? Well, do you remember the illustration I gave earlier about the mercy rule that we did for my kid, right? A really interesting thing happened after we did that. Because the next time, it was probably like an hour later that we were having to discipline him again. <laughs> it wasn't. It was probably the next day or a few days later. We're in there and we're in the bad bathroom. I'm like, son, what did you do? And he's like, you know, I punched my sister. And I go, okay, why'd you, why'd you do that? Because I was upset that she stole my doll. No, I'm just kidding. Don't quote that <laughs> to him. Those of you that know him. And he, he would say, I'm like, well, what do you deserve? And he goes, Dad, please have mercy. And he goes, mercy, Daddy, mercy. And what he meant was, I mean, what a great heart in this moment. Like, he's like, Daddy, give me grace. Don't, don't give me what I deserve, but give me what I don't deserve. Let's go to Dairy Queen again, right? Please be gracious to me. It was so precious, and honestly... Part of that is the heart that I wish I had with my heavenly father at times. But here's the problem. The more and more we did it, and the more grace that we gave, the more he began to expect the grace. Like clockwork, it began to happen almost every time. And guess what? I could even from time to time sense in him a bit of disgust when he didn't get the grace and mercy. You see, we'd walk through that plan and, and he'd say, Dad, please have mercy. And I go, we're going to, we need to be disciplined this time. And you could see this feeling of like, well, that's unfair. Anyone ever been there? Yeah? Well, that's unfair, Dad. Students, listen to me. Listen really, really close to this. If you ever think that you deserve grace, it's no longer grace. Do you understand that? If you ever think that someone needs to be merciful to you, you have not understood mercy and grace. Well, let's put it in your context, okay? Um, let's say by some freak chance that you're late on a homework assignment. I know that probably doesn't happen at the Christian school. It happens at my son where he goes. And you go to your teacher and uh, 
you say, hey, would you please be gracious to me and just give me the full, because I, I did all the work. And then you get upset because they dock you the whole letter grade and they didn't give you grace. You know what that tells me? And it should tell you is that you do not understand grace. Let's say you do something really dumb and you end up in the principal's office. Ms. Ortiz, right? Is that true? And let's say that you do something so dumb that she needs to suspend you. (gasps) And you look at her and you're like, please just be gracious to me. Please let me stay in school. Which is probably a word that you probably never thought you'd ever say, right? And she doesn't. And you get suspended. And you get upset because she didn't show grace. That should tell you that you do not understand grace. Do you get it? Because the person who presumes grace or assumes that grace should happen has no idea what grace is about. And teachers, let me just defend the students here for a second. If you only show grace when your students have done the right things, you might not understand grace either. The person who expects grace is really choosing to live their life on merit instead of what God has done on the cross. And if we live our life without understanding the holiness of God and seeing his his daily grace of forbearance of our sins, we quickly grow to the point of making his, his grace cheap by expecting it. See, the most mysterious aspect, and I think the most Uh, the most mysterious aspect of this whole thing um, should never be, like when you read the Old Testament, the most mysterious thing is not that a sinner dies, but why everyone doesn't die. The issue is not why God punishes sin, but why does he permit this ongoing human rebellion? See, it's customary. I think it's usual for God to be forbearing. And what happens is we become so used to it. We become so used to his grace in our daily life that when we do bad stuff and we do these things, that he doesn't just wham, lightning bolt comes down and kills someone. And we become so used to this, this just living in this this world of grace that he is indeed long-suffering and he is patient and he's slow to anger. In fact, he's so slow to anger and he's so slow with his grace. I'm sorry, he's so fast with his grace that when his anger does erupt or when things do happen, that we become shocked and we become offended by it. We forget rather that God's patience is designed to lead us to repentance. His grace is that he's giving us time to deal with our hearts before him. This is why when something tragic does happen in the Bible or even in our own life and God's judgment is seen on full display, we balk. We don't like it. Why? Because we've become so used to his grace that it doesn't mean that much to us anymore. Students, I'm telling you, this is one of the main reasons why people leave the church is because they become so used to grace that they expect it meaning they don't understand it so what do we do well let me just read a verse here out of 1 Peter chapter 5 go back up to the beginning part of that passage in verse 6 where he says humble yourselves Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Here it is, ready? When exposed to God's grace, we humble ourselves. That's what we do. 
we place ourselves, we submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and we trust him for exaltation at his perfect timing. And then we cast ourselves. We cast our anxieties. I love that where it says in verse 7, casting all your anxieties on him. Actually, the wording there is not just, like, don't just cast your worries. It's cast the worrier, you. You cast yourself on him. You cast the worry upon him. Why? It's putting ourselves in subjection to him in all things, but then our worries come back from the very beginning. But Thad, you're saying to me, if I humble myself and I cast myself to be exposed by him, will he still love me? Peter says, here's why you do it, because he cares for you. Students, No one loves you more than the Lord God. And no one knows you more than him. So we cast ourselves on him and all worries upon him because he cares for us. He is the God of all grace. Can I pray for you as students? Father, just uh, I pray for these young people that you would help them to understand grace, to understand not expect it, not demand it. Man, that's not grace. And uh, help them to want it. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Find in the Lord everything necessary for life and godliness. Amazing grace, you know, that song really explains why it's amazing. Because it saves wretches like us. And if you ever lose sight of the fact that you're a wretch in need of grace, then you have affirmed his message. Mm -hmm. Don't lose sight of that. I'd like to ask you one question. Maybe you could just fill us in on on your mission to these churches. Are you working with broken churches, churches yes. that are closing their doors, reviving churches. What's going on? Just yeah. in a couple minutes. Yeah, all that. Uh, we, we, uh, we do a lot of like church revitalization work. So churches that are 88% of churches in North America have plateaued or are, are in decline. 88%. Yeah, and so we try and come in and work with churches, help them to revitalize. Really what we want churches to do is to own the lostness of the community around them. And so we offer a lot of different tools and assessments to help them understand their church, help them understand their community, who, who are the ethnic groups, who are people in their community being missed with the gospel, and uh, then um, encourage them and walk them through, like, how can we mobilize your people, and then how can we help you um, plant churches to reach the lost people in your community? 